The Manama Dialogue Security Conference took place last weekend. A yearly chance for regional and world politicians to mingle. It was graced this year by the presence of Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission President. I would like to use that occasion to explore the EU Gulf relations and the conference's meaning in that context. I realize it sounds rather nerdy, but I believe it is a subject worth exploring. Uh, despite the non existent media attention it attracts, it is important to know what's what, because geopolitics in the Gulf and Middle East generally reflect the situation in Europe. Instability in states such as Libya, where the Gulf monarchies game for their own interests, have a direct link to what's going on in the EU. Libya, the last stop on the migrant trail to Europe, is a perfect example, and so is Syria. In both cases, instability and lack of security allows for a flow of refugees to EU, whose presence on the continent is used by our own extremist groups to destabilize Europe's internal politics. Just a little side point here, it is not refugees' responsibility to fight our neo-fascist and racists. That's our job. Nobody's running from home unless they have to. End of story. Coming back to the main subject. Trade going through the Suez Canal travels still next to Yemen, a war-torn country where Saudis and Emirates are major players. The risk that poses to sea trade is magnified by the attacks on tankers in the Strait of Hormuz, which is in the same neighborhood. Despite the above, EU has lagged behind when it comes to safeguarding its interest and influence on the region. At the same time, Gulf states began to shed their shyness on the global stage. Syria became an arena for indirect rivalry between Qatar, Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Likewise in Libya, where Qatar, UAE and Turkey support various pretenders for control of the whole country. Historically, there is surprisingly little interest in common EU foreign policy. In theory, that allows for more breathing room for individual EU members to create their own relations with the GCC countries, but in reality that weakens any European position. On one hand, it leads to confusion among state officials regarding the multi-layered and bureaucratized relations between different EU institutions and members. Let's be honest, we Europeans ourselves have that problem. Additionally, it's easier to play individual EU states. We could see that in the tensions between Germany and Saudi Arabia. Back in 2017, German Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel condemned the Saudis' growingly aggressive foreign policy, calling for an embargo on arms sales to the kingdom. In return, though, Saudi Arabia recalled its ambassador to Berlin and disallowed German firms from participating in Saudi state projects. Export to Saudi Arabia, Germany's third biggest trade partner, dropped by 5%. Sweden met a similar fate two years before. Then Chief of Swedish Foreign Ministry Margaret Wellström criticized the treatment of a jailed blogger Rai Badawi at the Saudi state and their allies the Emirates, recalled both of their ambassadors to Sweden. And going a step further, Saudi Arabia suspended issuing and renewing all business visas to Swedish citizens and Arab League the Union of 22 Arab States cancelled Wellstream's speech of women on women's rights, as she was to give it during an Arab League summit in Cairo. The monarchies yet invest their petrodollars in major European firms, from banks like Unicredit to energy funds and car makers to real estate and sports clubs like PSG. It's been especially noticeable after the 2008 financial crisis, which shaken much of the continent. Naturally, those investments were much in the injection of cash, but on the other hand, they increased our dependency on foreign sources of funding, coming from rich and also non-democratic leaders. There is a suspicion that Qatar's investment in the Paris Saint-Germain football club was indeed a way for Qatar to say thanks for the 2022 World Cup. I mean, we've walked into that one before. Seeking new investments in economies touched by the crisis, European states zeroed in on bilateral relations, mostly in the economic and cultural sphere. Their biggest feature was passivity, compliance 
and a wand to America's security umbrella. Our absence was evident, for example, during the 2017 to 21 Qatar crisis. Thus, the GCC states don't have the tradition to see EU members as credible partners who come with serious offers. It is only intensified by this certain cognitive dissonance and hypocrisy of the West, who, after centuries of imperialism and turning a blind eye to Israeli and Russian crimes, as well as its own rule of law crisis, lectures the rest of the world on human rights. For mentioned investments only add to the feeling that, despite the moralizing tone, Europe is easy to buy. The energy crisis caused by Russian imperialism has woken up the West to the need for good relations with the resource-rich Persian Gulf. It is exemplified awesomely by Joe Biden, who had to finally meet the Saudi ruler Mohammed bin Salman this summer, after arguing for years that he is a pariah of the world. EU seems to follow his footsteps, hence Ursula von der Leyen's visit to Bahrain. In her speech, she underlines the region's role as a stable energy partner, and she opened a possibility for energy cooperation point blank, stating the next winter remains a challenge. She later gives attention to Iran's alliance with Russia and the drone attack on the Pacific Silicon tanker, of which Iran is suspected. Iran's foreign policy is a sore spot for the GCC. We could go even as far as say that it's a salt in their collective eye. The region is now going on through its own Cold War, a rivalry between Iran and countries grouped around Saudi Arabia. Actions of Iran and Russia called for strengthening of the security architecture and further cooperation, says von der Leyen. Thus, a special representative is to arrive to the Gulf by the end of the year. EU has nine such representatives, usually in conflicted areas. Spring has seen several meetings, among them Saudi Education Vice Minister Saad al fuhaid speaking with Patrick Simonnet, EU Delegation Chief to the Kingdom. Through Riyadh also came Ilka Salm, EU Counter-Terrorism Coordinator, meeting with Walid Hareiji, Saudi Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. That continued in September, when European Council Chief Charles Michel met with rulers from Saudi Arabia, UAE and Qatar. Joseph Borrell, Chief EU Diplomat, spoke with GCC Foreign Affairs Ministers, and Enrique Mora, Vice Secretary General of the EU External Service, came to Qatar. Michel's travels to the region were the first by an acting president of the European Council, and him visiting Algeria, a major gas producer itself, right before coming here, is an important signal regarding EU, EU's priorities. Indeed, it did publish its strategy for relations with the Gulf back in May, planning for rather wide cooperation. The Union sees a chance for deeper economic relations in regional plans for economic diversification, locally known as visions, to boot. It seeks more activity in security and, of course, energy. EU plans to intensify its cooperation regarding especially renewable energy, including hydrogen. That indeed makes sense, doesn't it? Since the regional potential for producing wind and solar energy is palpable, though. The security strategy is dominated by two things safety and sea, and military communication. Securing the sea trade routes is chiefly based on the operation Atalanta, EU's fight against piracy on the Somalia coast, and the escalation efforts in the Strait of Hormuz. Tankers have been attacked there for years, recently, the Pacific Circle. EU plans to combat proliferation and use of certain weapons, and seeks communication on military exercises, budgets and policies. Iran, of course, has found its place in that context, especially regarding the nuclear deal. The Gulf's Arab monarchies felt betrayed by Obama's and Biden's approaches, which they see as too forgiving to Tehran. EU claims it is the regional countries that should be the most active in de-escalating their neighborly tensions with only a supporting role of the international community. Ursula von der Leyen noted in her speech the Russo-Iranian alliance in, the aggression, in their aggression against Ukraine. She gave credence to GCC rulers' rhetoric, who have warned for years about Iran's adventurous foreign policy. They accuse Iran of acting to destabilize the region, for example by supporting the Ansar al-Lakh in Yemen. According to them, it is Iran who is behind the attacks on tankers, like the Pacific Circle, and their own oil infrastructure. Turning further against the Islamic Republic, von der Leyen announced further sanctions against its officials, and further restrictions on Iran's arms industry is also necessary, she said.
Iran's cooperation with Russia has indeed brought the Iranian threat closer to home. That is music to the Gulf monarch's ears. They can now feel vindicated and hurt, finally. Their relations with Iran continue to be tense, regardless of the recent signals of a possible trouble. General terrorist politics of Russia gave them another gift, Europe's further energy dependence and the stronger standing on the international stage that comes with it. It may at first appear to run contrary to our plans for greener energy, but as Ursula von der Leyen noted herself, that itself gives enormous chances to cooperate. That's all for me for today. Thank you for watching. Good day.